Hello, good evening. You're watching News 360 from the News Hub at Adisawe in Accra. My name is Portia Gabo. And my name is Issa Mone. Coming up now, the headlines for tonight. Stay with us. News 360 headlines is brought to you by... Irene fisher folk from fishing communities in Greater Accra region disrupt meeting scheduled between fisheries minister and their leadership. We will go to the Volta region where one person shot again in protracted Alavanya and Konya chieftaincy conflict. And the Minister of Food and Agriculture sets up emergency spraying guns to begin spraying affected army worm infested farms in the Bonafo region, the hardest hit region. Coming up in international news reports suggest as many as 140 people, including civilians, may have died in an attack on an airbase in Libya. And right, we have the details including sports and entertainment coming up this hour. Stay with us as we bring you the details. You're watching News 360 from the News Hub. An irate fisher folk from some fishing communities in the Greater Accra region have disrupted a meeting scheduled between the fisheries minister and their leadership. They have accused their leadership of being in bed with the ministry to ban light fishing, an activity they undertake for their survival. More than 300 fisher folks from Jamestown, Tema New Town, Sege and Ada in the Greater Accra region besieged the premises of the Civil Service Training School to disrupt the meeting. The meeting scheduled by the sector minister, Elizabeth Afolikwe, was intended to address light fishing and illegal fishing practice. But the fisher force claimed their leaders did not consult them before coming for the meeting, adding if the ban becomes successful, it will affect their livelihood. The meeting was cancelled, but the irate fishermen physically assaulted some of their leaders. The aggrieved fisher folks also held some of their leaders hostage for more than 30 minutes, threatening to assault all of them. The three police officers present could not control the irate fisher folk. The fisher folks claim they have lost trust in their leadership. Ben Ashite claims some Chinese are involved in patrolling, pushing the fish into deep sea, hence they are resorting to light fishing. They are doing patrolling in the system right now, I'm telling you. How they have to travel from uh, uh, 36 miles, go up. Right now they are coming down. Six, seven, eight, ten that they are trolling. What are we going to say? We are suffering. We don't get fish. But the leaders denied the allegations. I just saw the crowd here. I don't know what is happening. So I, to me, it marvels me what is happening now. I don't know what is happening. I don't know the are I don't know, no, 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 no. I didn't invite anybody. We were invited by the minister. Unfortunately, the minister was not here. So I can't tell. Please. It will be recorded that two weeks ago, the same irate fisher folks stormed and disrupted a function by the sector minister at Otrupe to inaugurate an anti-illegal fishing tax force to regulate illegal fishing activities in all fishing communities in the country. It has been very chaotic and we are told that because of security reasons and concerns, the minister was not allowed to come for this meeting. Salam Amina, TV3 News, Accra. And joining me on the phone line is the Minister for Fisheries and Aquaculture, Elizabeth Nafolikwe. Good evening and thanks for your time. Good evening. 
We've just witnessed these chaotic scenes involving some fisher folk in the greater Accra region. But what exactly was today's meeting going to achieve? Um, this meeting was supposed to have been a, a stakeholders meeting of the fish ministry and the fisher folk. We really wanted to have some dialogue with the fisher folk regarding the illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. Um, predominantly, we have had issues with uh, light fishing. Light fishing has become very prevalent in, in our waters. And so recent, recently, we have had to arrest some light fishers. Mm. Light fishing is an outlawed method of fishing in Ghana. And um, this law was passed in 2010 and so we have always expected that the fish have known what to do the right thing to do but they have not paid heed to this law mm. and so we we had some initially had some negotiations with the leadership of the fisher folk uh, but unfortunately this light fishing has become very prevalent a lot of people are engaged mm. and so we had to get uh, they are fellow fisher folk who to fight the wrong. And so some fishermen were arrested. And those who were engaged in the light fishing were not so happy with what was happening. And so we thought that today we could have some dialogue with them, try to sensitize them regarding what they were doing, what we felt was wrong. But unfortunately, when we called them to this meeting, we wrote, we wrote to them. We wrote to the uh, no fishermen association. We wrote to the National uh, Fish Processors Association. We wrote to all the related institutions mm -hmm. and invited them to a meeting. So we thought that it was going to be uh, in a more um, civilized uh, manner. But unfortunately, these fishermen came in their numbers and they were chanting. They, they, they were saying that they were going to continue this light fishing. Okay. They wanted to continue the wrong. And so we, we thought that we should call the meeting off. Now, so just off. two yes. weeks ago, we witnessed similar incidents at Ochotpe, also in the greater Accra region. Does this suggest mm. that dialogue has not gone down well? Because they claim you want to take their livelihood away from them while the Chinese are involved in patrolling. Unfortunately, um, I, in fact, they, they cannot be talking about petroling now because petroling is not happening in our waters now. But light fishing is what is going on. And this light fishing is uh, by Ghanaians and Ghanaians who front for the Chinese. And so we're arresting uh, or trying to stop Ghanaians from doing light fishing, but we are, all, we are fighting light fishing in general and so we we are also um dealing with the chinese who are involved in this light fishing in fact um early early this week on tuesday we inaugurated a task force that was going to go to the harbors to to inspect vessels in vessels that are not complying with our law we 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 sanctioned mm -hmm. them and we appealed the law to those who are not complying with our regulations. Mm. And they are not just who are doing the wrong, but we are, we are battling all, you know, light fishing in totality. Okay. Now, moving forward, how do you intend resolving this situation? Um, I believe in dialoguing. I believe in uh, diplomacy. I believe in negotiation. I believe that uh, if, we, if we have... Uh, we, we sit and discuss our problems and find ways of resolving uh, uh, the challenges, then of course uh, we will find ourselves moving on as a nation. But uh, unfortunately, people think that they should be applauded for doing the wrong. Mm. And they can't test out and, and say that they want to continue what they are doing, which is wrong. This fight fishing is killing human beings. It is devastating. It is causing the depletion of our fish stock. It is, it, it is not right. It, 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 you know, we have had surveys upon surveys 
assessment surveys, and we know that it is scientifically proved that our trade results mm. have been over depleted. And so this light fishing, they apply chemicals and chemicals that affect the, the health of the consumer. So I do not think that I have to condone with this as a fisheries minister. We mm. do not think that we have to condone with this as the uh, Ministry of Fisheries and the Fisheries Commission. Uh, we want to fight and, and continue this fight and ensure that this light fishing is over and done with. All right. And Thank we, you we very are much. We are really worried about find ways of negotiating with them, having some dialogue with them okay. to ensure in our, in our society. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Now for Lukwe as the Minister for Fisheries and Aquaculture. Let's now go to the Volta region where a middle-aged woman has been killed by unknown assailant at Alavanyo. Madame Elizabeth Ankou's death has been linked to the century-long protracted land disputes between indigents there and those from neighboring Inkonya. Lives have been lost as a result of the misunderstanding over a parcel of land with five persons being shot dead since April this year. Today's shooting incident comes a day after government renewed the curfew hours imposed on the Alavonio and Inconia Township from 8 p.m. to 5.30 a.m., which is expected to take effect from Sunday, May 21, 2017. A youth leader in Alavanyo, Kwekwa Abuchi, who confirmed the incident to TV3, said the gunmen opened fire on a group of women who had gathered under a mango tree, killing one around 7.30 Saturday morning. All right, you're watching News 360, and uh, Dr. Archibald Lecha is the Volta Regional Minister and Chairman of the Regional Security Council. Good evening, Dr. Lecha, and thank you for joining us. Good evening. Good evening to your listeners. Thank you. Well, and as Chairman of the Regional Security Council, are you not worried that at least three people have died in separate shooting incidents in just about a month in your area? Yes, thank you very much. We are very much worried. And uh, uh, we are doing our best uh, that this does not continue. Uh, this one uh, happened early this morning. Uh, we informed that around 7 a.m., uh, some unidentified gunmen, you know, fired several gunshots from the Nkunyatai Alabanyu Kweme Mountain towards the Alabanyu Kweme. Uh, the army base, the military base, was also attacked, but they were able to repel the attack. Then around 9 a.m., the task force received a complaint that the deceased had gone to the bush in the morning and had not returned. So an attempt was made to look for her, and when they traced her, and found her dead with several gunshot wounds. Um, and, and, and this is, is just unfortunate because the, the, the last... The uh, attack was also in Alabanyo Kweme. And these things are happening right at the outskirts of the, of, of the towns. And this has nothing to do with the disputed land. Uh, so this we are treating as criminal uh, at, um, activities which are being investigated by the security. Meanwhile, the Regional Security Council meets again on Monday. We are going to engage the Regional Peace Council so that we go back to the area and speak to the chiefs and the people to try and give us information as to the perpetrators of these uh, uh, actions because we are treating this as crime because the, all the attacks in recent times have not occurred on the disputed land. They seem to be uh, revenge attacks or uh, retaliatory attacks and uh, I think uh, we, sh this, we should try to bring this to an end. It's like tit, tit, tit for attack, attacks, and it's just uh, uh, unfortunate. Uh, right. Whatever, so, um, whatever we can do uh, to bring this under control, I think we we try to do that. And if you recall, hmm. in recent times, the region has achieved it, suspended the paramount chief of Nkunya and Alabanyu because they, 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 they think that they should be able to bring their people, their subjects under control. 
And we are doing our best. The security agencies, I must confess, are doing their best to monitor the situation and to maintain law and order. But these are sporadic attacks by unknown people and the, and the citizens of the area are supposed to provide the security agencies with information. So we are counting on their support. And once they are prepared to support us, I think that the criminal elements will be identified and brought to book. Right, Dr. Lecha, so what more can you do since I gather from your submission right now that the action is taking place on the undisputed land? What can you do there? Uh, what we're doing is to improve accessibility in the area. We have tried to improve on the roads in the area, mm. and we are still doing more uh, to make it possible for the police and the military to, uh, to patrol the area at very regular intervals. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, uh, they are taking us by surprise because uh, these things are also occurring outside the curfew hours. And uh, the last one was at 3.30 p.m. in the afternoon when people's walls were killed and innocent citizens were attacked with AK-47 rifles. Mm. And, and today, uh, the same thing has happened. And, and and the question is, where are they getting these weapons from? So the security mm. agencies are trying to investigate to find out exactly where, where the problem is so that we can address them. But at the same time, we are engaging the community, we are engaging the youth, the chiefs, and appealing to them to make sure that peace is maintained in the area because these are retaliations, the reprisal attacks. One community loses a person, and they also plan some elements in that community try to uh, attack uh, to to revenge the the, the, the death of their of, of, of their of their citizens. Okay. So it is uh, it is something that we will continue to work on. It's been a long-standing uh, problem, but it's, it's moved from land issue to purely criminal issue now because the disputed land is there and they are killing innocent citizens right at the outskirts of the town. Oh, okay. So these criminals lay ambush. Right. They so lay ambush and, and they fire at whoever they uh, come, come to sight. Okay, and thank you very much. Dr. Archibald Lecha, he is the Water Regional Minister and Chairman of the Regional Security Council talking about recent attacks he says are happening on the undisputed land between Nkunya and Alavanos. Now, a group, Ada Youth for Development, is demanding that the Regional Minister Ishmael Ashte reinstate nine government appointees whose appointments were revoked at the Ada East Assembly with immediate effect. They also want an embargo to be placed on the assembly spending for two years lifted. The Ada Youth for Development alleged the action of the regional minister Ishmael Ashiti was an abuse of power and political victimization. They further alleged that nine government appointees of the Ada East Assembly had their appointments revoked by the regional minister after they failed to endorse the president's nominee, Sarah Povey. Ours is to set fair rules. As you said in your inaugural speech, we asked, where are the fair rules you refer to when the regional minister, Honorable Ishmael Ashiti, is using political power to undermine the electoral processes of the Ada East District Assembly. The group also indicated the minister has also placed an embargo on the expenditure of the district for the next two years, which they argued would store development. There's no one at post. So definitely, they are going to rely on the Greater Accra Regional Minister for those endorsements. So why the embargo? Is it to victimize our people? Is it to ride on our rights, our democratic rights? On Monday 16th, the Assembly voted 13 yes and 23 no. As a result, the President's nominee failed to get the nod. They want sacked appointees to be reinstated as soon as possible. Let's now go to the Bonafo region where the approval of the president's nominee in the Sinyan West District has been postponed indefinitely. This follows the confusion that disrupted counting of votes. 
The Sunyai West District Assembly is made up of 54 assembly members. All were present during the confirmation of the president's nominee, Martin Obey. When the vote was taken, 35 of the assembly members voted yes, while 19 voted no. The nominee fell short of gaining the two-thirds approval by a single vote. When the accounting process began, some people suspected foul play and disrupted proceedings. Security had to use tear gas to restore calm. Some physically challenged persons who were present in their numbers to give support to the nominee, who is also physically challenged, did not take kindly to what happened. A press conference organized at the forecourt of the assembly by the physically challenged protested the situation, describing it as discriminatory. Joshua Makubu addressed the press. The disability movement has appealed to the president for appointment of qualified PWD into local government system. It appears so far that it is only Sunyani West, this is where this expectation has been met. We were therefore surprised. Some 19 people decided that Martin should not be giving them confirmation. This is unfortunate. Right, let's stay in Bravo, where the regional minister, Asuma Chireme, has sworn in 24 of the confirmed municipal and district chief executives to start their official duties in their various assemblies. Out of the 27 nominees by the president, six of them are females, an improvement in the ratio of females who have occupied the positions in previous years. The swearing-in ceremony was attended by traditional leaders in the region and the MPP party sympathizers, including former MPs and MDCEs. The regional minister, Soma Chireme, charged the MDCEs to tackle issues of sanitation and infrastructural projects with all seriousness for the development of their communities. I urge you to seek appropriate solutions to all demands of the people by the provision of infrastructure and special amenities to demand the fair and equitable share of the national aid. The district chief executive of Techima North, Peter Mensah, was optimistic that developments in the area would speed up and promised to revamp the Wenchi tomato factory. Chiobodom share a boundary with Wenchi that has already got an established tomato factory and for that matter Techima. So I'm working hand in hand with my municipal chief executive, John Dojina, so that we can revive those two factories, at the end of the day, the families will have a very joyous moment in, in, in going into farming. Another voting exercise will be held for the remaining three nominees who failed to meet the required two-thirds votes at their various districts in the coming weeks. And away from the Bonafo region, Ghana and Cape Verde have resolved to deepen ties in the areas of fisheries and tourism. President Ekufuado is advocating the implementation of measures to enhance trade and business between the two countries. President Ekufuado was speaking after meeting with his Cape Verdean counterpart, President George Fonseca, at the beginning of his three-day visit to the country. President Ekufuado bemoaned the fact that little has been done to promote trade between the two countries, insisting it is time to implement deliberate measures to turn the situation around. We don't trade other parts of the world, don't trade with each other. If there can be to economic links as good. We have agreed with the president to establish a cooperation with work in which I'm going to an investment concern. We promote direct links. Coming from a president's undertake car to Casablanca, even if we can find having direct air, air shipping links. The president also called for efforts to increase the volume of trade. President Ecuador was hopeful the two countries would also forge ahead for a stronger frontier. And executives of the Ghana Journalists Association have been blamed for contributing to issues of non-payment of dues, resulting in the initial disqualification of some aspirants for the 2017 elections. Chairman of the Election Dispute Adjudication Committee, Yao Buedu, noted the executives failed to follow up on the dues paid by members through their media houses. The 2017 Ghana Journalist Association elections was originally scheduled for March 31. 
However, on March 7, the election committee released a statement disqualifying some candidates on several grounds, including not having been members for more than three years and claims that some had not paid dues for a period of 90 days prior to the elections. On Friday, May 12, the Election Dispute Adjudication Committee released a statement calling for the disqualified candidate who were deemed not to have paid their dues to stand. The constitution says that when it is practicable for the executive to seek deduction of the dues at source, it must make arrangement. And where such arrangement have been made, then it is the primary responsibility of the executive to ensure that the dues that are so deducted are paid to the association. As far as the deduction has been effected on your pay slip, the obligation rests with the executive okay. to ensure that that is done. And that is one of some of the basis why we came to the conclusion that we came to. The incumbent Ghana Journalist Association president and presidential aspirant, Dr. Ronald Afilmoni, welcomed the outcome. The committee has come up with a report which hopefully should uh, instill a semblance of sanity and peace on our front so that we should all be seen to be pulling in one direction. Lloyd Evans was initially disqualified from the presidential race. So far as um, they've cleared me, they've done a good job. If they had not cleared me, you know, we'll go back to it again because there's no reason why I should be disqualified. It was orchestrated, which I know, and I don't want to go into, you know, into the details. Could you believe that even before I even appeared before the vetting committee, <laughs> I had the message that will oh, ask for me when I come to disqualify me. Another presidential aspirant, Johnny Aite, says the committee had ignored some concerns he raised about the exclusion of his supporters from the voters' register. Most of the chapters don't work. In GBC here, the chapter is dead. It's been dead for a while. If we go to the regions, the chapters are dead. That's not the kind of association I saw growing up. We have got to revive it. We've got to stand up for our people. In other news, the Institute for Energy Security, IES, is projecting a further 3% drop in fuel prices. The IES says its forecast is based on the fall in the price of Brent crude in the past 15 days. The Chamber of Petroleum Consumers, however, says most oil marketing companies will not adjust their prices. Principal research analyst of the petroleum unit at IES, Gilbert Richmond Roxon, attributed the possible drop in prices at the local pump to crude oil price falling by over 5% and gasoline and gas oil prices dropping by approximately 8%. Fuel stores capable of meeting over four weeks of national demand and the city remaining fairly stable against the dollar. The drop on the world market pushed average Brent crude price from $52.97 per barrel to $50.17 per barrel. I realize that the major determinant here is the prices for crude oil and the plus benchmark as well. And putting this thing together, I realize that the prices must go down in this window, about 3%. And if you ch make your checks, you realize that some OMCs have already reduced their prices. He indicated a significant drop in the price of crude oil on the world market will impact negatively on government revenue. Once consumers are praying that it will go down so that the prices will reduce on the local market, um, government also loses revenue if the prices go down significantly. From last year, that is what OPEC has been trying to do. OPEC basically they decided to cap production so that they will stimulate prices. The executive secretary of the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers, Duncan Amwa, is of the view that prices could go down by a maximum of 1.66%. He indicated most of the oil marketing companies will be waiting for next month's pricing window to adjust prices as crude prices have started going up. What we as COPEC are expecting generally uh, wouldn't be any reduction below 1.66%, if anything at all. But generally, most are likely to stay prices uh, because of the volatility of uh, world market prices and then again, the city's performance over the past three, four, five days. Duncan Amwa, however, thinks consumers are still paying much more at the pumps. It might not be as much as uh, people would want to see, but 
Uh, reductions anywhere are welcome news, and we would have wished fuel prices go down uh, beyond what we have currently. But again, uh, sometimes you have to be fair to the oil marketing companies not to squeeze them too much. The next petroleum downstream pricing window is on June 1. And the police in La have arrested a 41-year-old self-styled nurse who has been operating for many years as a doctor and majored himself in illegal abortion. Godwin Kwame Adajoa was arrested at Choko Lantimami near Kolebu in Accra following a complaint by a 22-year-old student of La. 41-year-old Godwin Kwame Adajawa was arrested on Thursday, May 18, at his makeshift pharmacy at Choko Lante Mami, near Kolibu, here in Accra. The police alleged the suspect also seized the 22-year-old senior high school student's iPad after illegally aborting her one-month-old pregnancy. A search in the suspect's makeshift pharmacy at Choco Lante Mami revealed some hospital equipment used in performing the illegal abortion. The La District Commander Chief Superintendent Udro Amenin told the media the victim made the complaint on Wednesday, May 17, but the incident reportedly occurred in December last year. According to him, the victim was introduced to the suspect by a friend as a result of her fiancé's refusal to accept responsibility for their pregnancy. Chief Superintendent Udro Amenin said the victim allegedly deposited her iPad with suspect Gordon Kwame Adajawa because she could not raise the full amount charged for the abortion. The police said suspects Adajawa later demanded sex in place of the money and locked up the victim for four days during which he subjected her to sexual torture. Chief Superintendent Udru Amenin said the suspect again declined to release the iPad he took earlier as collateral and 400 cities promised the victim. When we went to the area yesterday, everybody was mentioning doctor, doctor. So those people who has gone to him for the abortion can come out for us to know how many people he has operated on them. However, some neighbors in Choco have expressed surprise at how the victim was allegedly kept in the structure without the attention of neighbors. You're still watching News 360 from the News Hub. Still to come in this bulletin. The Ministry of Food and Agriculture sets up emergency spraying gangs to begin spraying affected and worm infested farms in the Bonafu region, the hardest hit in the regions. And on the international front, reports suggest as many as 140 people, including civilians, may have died in an attack on an air base in Libya. We have details coming up shortly. Don't go away. Right, let's do some more news. And the Ministry of Food and Agriculture has set up an emergency spraying gangs to start spraying affected farms in the Bonafo region as soon as possible. The region is the hardest hit by the army worms invasion in the country. A report by Larry Park with Simosis. The Minister of State in charge of food and agriculture said all the regions in the country, with the exception of the Volta region, are affected by army worms. In Bonahafo alone, 16 out of the 27 districts which lie in the Savannah Belt are among the hardest hit areas in the region. The minister said government is treating the army worms evasion as a national crisis and has set aside 16 million Ghana cities for the purchase of pesticides and other inputs to fight the devastating canker. The 16 million that has been um, provided is not for the control of um, these districts that are currently affected that we are talking about. It is for the control and enough chemical will be stored for the uh, minor season and in, uh, enough for the whole northern sector who are also still planting. For any disease, the surveillance is a major issue in control. Meanwhile, the 2015 National Best Farmer has been presented with his award. 
The managing director of the Agriculture Development Bank, Daniel Asiedu, handing over keys to the national best farmer, Ibrahim Musa, said the bank sponsors the awards of the national best farmer as a way of encouraging farmers to increase their productivity. The 2015 National Best Farmer Ibrahim Musa said farming is a lucrative business and called on the youth to enter into farming. <laughs> I urge the youth to take up farming. They shouldn't concentrate on education only. It is even more lucrative when you are educated because you can understand the modern methods better. Away from the Bonafu region, the aviation minister Cecilia Dapa has ordered the suspension of payment of check by the contractor renovating the wire airstrip until some additional works are finally done. The sector minister was addressing journalists at the wire airstrip during her working visit to the Upper West region. A report by Yakubu Abdul Gaffar. During the minister's tour of an aviation building under renovation in WA, she observed some minor works have not met the standard to enable the WA airstrip receive domestic flights and has called on the contractor to redo the work before payment. The contractor needs to put right. The tarmac had been there, they did some work markings on them, but the actual terminal building, we have a few issues with that. We've told him he's willing to work on them before his final payment, and I'm going to insist on that. The aviation minister noted woods were used on some parts of the building to make the facility disability friendly, but insisted it must be redone using concrete to make it durable. The minister in her media briefings, however, hinted that a wire airstrip will soon be commissioned for domestic flights before the end of the year. An encroachment on the Wa airstrip land, the minister pledged to collaborate with stakeholders for the demolition of structures within the buffer zone. The issue of ownership of the said land has been in court after some 300 houses were earmarked for demolition in August 2013 by government. Earlier, the aviation minister Cecilia Abnadapa paid a courtesy call on the Upper West Regional Minister Hassan Suleimana who also expressed joy about her visit, indicating having domestic flights in WA would boost the economic activities of the region. The regional minister has made a special appeal, the chiefs have made a special appeal, and we have taken on board those appeals. The president has told us that he's in a hurry, which means we should all be in a hurry. At the Wana's Palace, a representative of the overlord of the Wala traditional area, Wana Fuseni Seidu Pelpo IV, Guli Na Seidu Braima, called on the government to speed up efforts in making sure the Wa airstrip is operational. He also urged the government to develop the airstrip in making it an international airport. The people of this area think that if the airport is worked on quickly, when the planes are flying in, it will go a long way to boost economic activities in this part of the country and also help us. The minister was accompanied by the deputy minister of aviation, the manager of Ghana Airports Company at the Tamale Airport, who is also in charge of the WA Airstrip and other government officials. And what will you do if you returned home after being captured for over two years? And how would you relate to your friends and family after such a long period away? Would life ever be the same for you? Natalie Fort finds out what's next for the 82 girls freed by Islamist militant group Boko Haram. On Saturday, May 6, 82 of the girls kidnapped by Islamist militants Boko Haram in northeast Nigeria in 2014 were freed. The ordeal of being captured by Boko Haram does not end simply in the release of the captives. For most of the girls, mental, emotional and psychological effects make it a struggle to integrate back into their families and community life. In total, 103 girls have been released by the Islamist militant group. Nigeria's Women Affairs Minister Aisha Al-Hassan says they would return to school in September. 
A counseling psychologist, Joyce Chum, says reintegration for these girls, though necessary, would be an extremely difficult task. The girls have gone through trauma. Their families have gone through trauma. They all went as young girls. Some of them are coming back as mothers, religious extremism, which they may be coming with. Each of the girls should go through individual counseling to ascertain the extent to which the, the trauma has affected them. She recommends family therapy rather than isolation. They haven't lost their girls, their daughters, went through their own trauma and are still experiencing trauma. There has to be some sensitization of students in the schools for them to understand what these girls have been through and to embrace them into the school system and not to stigmatize them. International relations expert Dr. Efwa Yakuhene was of the view the international community played its part. However, the onus lied on the Nigerian state. It's to the state that the people have given their power to and the, and the state must protect them. Then the question that we should pose is what has the Nigerian state done? Because its initial inaction and unresponsive nature has strongly given Boko Haram the clout that it has now. Captured as children, the Chibok girls, as they have come to be known, are being freed as young women. With an already fraught transition from adolescence to womanhood, complicated by their captivity, a sound reintegration into society is what the entire world hopes for the girls of Chibok. Natalie Fort, TV3 News. In other news, Vodafone Ghana has reiterated its commitment to help improve the lives of Ghanaians with its digital solutions. The company will be providing platforms to ease access to data for all, providing opportunities for customers to work smarter and efficient using modern digital tools and systems. A report by Benjamin Adu. Vodafone Ghana has over the years invested $1.7 billion in network infrastructure expansion and introduced innovative products to meet the needs of businesses and its subscribers. A new product, Vodafone Instant Schools, is being introduced in partnership with Learning Equality, a leading provider of open source educational technology solution and the Khan Academy. Students are provided with tutorials, past questions and practical work examples including English language, mathematics, arts, business and science. At a ceremony to launch the service at the DD Academy in Kumasi, Director of External and Legal Affairs Gerhard Mensa said the initiative is aimed at providing millions of people with free access to online learning materials. Instant schools offered school-going children from the primary level to the tertiary level an opportunity to access learning and teaching materials free of charge on the Vodafone website. The head teacher of D&D &D Academy, Madame Monica Addo, was enthused about the initiative. We think that it, it's a great program. Um, it's going to further support our learning procedures here because um, children can go on the net and study further, do exercises and instantly see their performances and also do further research. And Vodafone Ghana Foundation has organized free health screening to improve quality health care for residents of Kumasi and other communities in the Shanti region. Many of the beneficiaries who were children were diagnosed of having developed severe anemia. Benjamin Edu reports. Vodafone Ghana Foundation was launched in 2009 to support sustainable initiatives that drive social change, improve lives and solve pressing social needs. The foundation has introduced a number of activities to drive its new strategic objective of becoming a technology-oriented foundation. Director of the Vodafone Foundation, Ebenezer Mankwa, says combining charity work with technology will deliver transformational projects that enhances the life conditions of Ghanaians, especially in promoting access to quality health care. The issue in Ghana is that 
basic health care affordability is, is not common for the average Ghanaian. And that for us is a concern. So this is basically one of the platforms that we are trying to bridge the gap. So people will not be afraid to come for medical check because of money constraints. But they can come and get it for free, uh, courtesy of Vodafone Ghana Foundation. The health screening exercise in Kumasi form parts of activities to mark the 60th birthday celebration of Asantehene Otu for Osei to the second. Others also recommended Vodafone Foundation for their kind gesture. The leader of the health personnel at the event, Yvonne Asamwa, encouraged people to go for regular checkups and adopt healthy lifestyles. In other news, she was not born deaf, but at age 11, she was involved in an accident that made her become deaf and dumb. Due to her love and passion to change lives in her community, Genevieve Basiga set up a school in Obuasi in the Ashanti region, which caters for deaf and dumb children. Genevieve's efforts have been recognized as she has been adjudged the overall winner of this year's MTN Heroes of Change Season 3, bagging home 100,000 CDs. The MTN Ghana Foundation, which is one of the company's organizational arm, is aimed at steering its corporate social responsibility initiatives in the country. The foundation has impacted positively over 4 million Ghanaians directly since its inception in 2007. Attempt to unearth and celebrate people who are giving back to their communities in extraordinary ways, the foundation instituted the Heroes of Change program in 2013. This year's edition saw 107 entries but was whittled down to 10 nominees in the areas of education, health and economic empowerment, interventions which serve as the focal point of the foundation in improving access to quality education, adequate medical interventions as well as development of entrepreneurs. For providing food and shelter for orphans and setting up scholarship fund for brilliant and needy children in Namo in the Upper East Region, Reverend Father Dr. Moses Asa Awinduja was awarded winner of the education category. He took home 30,000 cities. The economic empowerment category went to James Jack Dawson for rescuing over 2,000 children from trafficking with his Apple Foundation in Atitekpo in the Volta region. He was presented with 30,000 cities. Winning the health category, Monsignor Alex Bobby Benson was also awarded 30,000 cities for catering for the needs of marginalized persons with HIV and AIDS with his Matthew 25 house. Genevieve Deaf and dumb Siga. Genevieve Basiga with her self-financed school catering for the deaf and dumb in Obuasi in the Ashanti region and her the overall winner of this year's Heroes of Change Season 3. She bagged home 100,000 cities, a trophy and a plaque. She expressed her joy through her interpreter. I, I, I am happy, I am free forever. Thank you. It is so surprising. Wonderful. Amazing. 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 Oh, God have way. God have way. Chief Executive Office of MTN, Ebenezer Chuma Sante, pledged the company's continuous contribution in empowering lives in the country. I am indeed excited to see the revelation of Season 3 MTN Heroes of Change. And I look forward to the recognition of many more heroes in the near future. You're on News 360, and then Akujo Afre is around, and definitely he will bring us sports after the break.
Good evening and welcome back to News 360 here on TV3. My name is Anako Jaffre with a sports update for you. And let's begin with an update on what has happened as far as the under-17 team is concerned. They took on Guinea in their final game in Group A and they drew goalers in that particular game. But what it means is that the under-17 team are through to the semi-final. They booked their place after their second win in the game against the host nation Gabon. But then they topped the group with seven points followed by... Um, Guinea, who um, have five points in there. So Ghana, Guinea, the first teams through to the semi-final of the under-17 Africa Youth Championship currently ongoing in Gabon. But back here in Ghana, in the MTN FA Cup, Comasia Sante Kotoko will shift their full court to the MTN FA Cup as they come up against Division 1 side. Proud United in the round of 32 in a way fixture at Aguna Suedro playing eight matches without a win coupled the frequent change of coaches the Bukupine Warriors are currently at the crossroads and need a win badly and the newly appointed coach Steven Polak other games to expect proud United um, Hearts of Folk will be at their cross post stadium they take on Kotoku Royals Brecombe Chelsea will be up against BA United and that is a brown half foot derby very interesting one in there while all stars will be up against against Boga All-Stars and Mediama Essie will take on new Edubiase United. So those are some of the games to look forward to in the MTN FA Cup round of 32. In Germany, Gabon striker Pierre Emerick Aubameyang struck a late penalty for Borussia Dortmund on the final day of the season to finish as the Bundesliga top scorer with 31 goals. Aubameyang scored twice to help Borussia Dortmund beat Werder Bremen 4-3, his first coming three minutes before the break and his second from the sport in the 89th minute. It put the 27-year-old one goal ahead of Bayern Munich's Robert Lewandowski, who failed to score for the German champions in their 4-1 win over Freiburg, Aubameyang becomes the only second African player to win the Golden Boot in Germany after Ghana's Tony Yeboah achieved that feat twice whilst playing for Eintracht Frankfurt in, in the 1992-1993 season and the following year in 1993-1994. To Ghana's strongest now add a great sense of purpose to the bodybuilding sport by redefining bodybuilding in Ghana after ex an exciting elimination stage last week. It was it all came down to the main show, the season six of Ghana's strongest, which took place at the Teshi Presby Square here in Accra. The competition saw all 12 athletes who made it through to the final elimination take part. The first event um, on the card was the overhead shoulder press, which Ahmed Boache came up on top with 24 reps in 30 in 24 seconds, but had few disappointing performances from the new faces in there. Now let's bring you the remaining fixtures for the English Premier League and it will be the final day of the season tomorrow on Sunday and these are the fixtures to look forward to. Arsenal will be up against Everton, Burnley will take on West Ham United, Chelsea Premier League champions. Isamone is happy about that, they take on Sunderland, Leicester City will be up against Bournemouth and then you have Liverpool taking on Middlesbrough and the, the other half of the fixtures will see Manchester United hoping to win the Europa League and get a place in the UEFA Champions. They take on Crystal Palace. Southampton will be up against Stoke City. Swansea City up against West Bromwich Albion. Watford will be up against Manchester City. And then Hull City versus Tottenham Hotspurs will end it. And that's all the sports news here on News 360. My name is Nana Kojafre. Porsche has never told me which teams she supports, but <laughs> Porsche, over to you. I'm a sympathizer of Oli Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, coming up, international news. Reports say as many as 140 people, including civilians, may have died in an attack at an air base in Libya. It was originally thought 60 people died when a government allied militia tried to take over the Brak al Shati base on Thursday. The UN-backed government's defense minister and the commander of the militia have both been suspended pending an investigation. The prime minister's office has denied ordering the attack. Up next is some um, international news. Entertainment news is brought to you by...
All right, we do some entertainment before bringing in the international news. And hundreds of people thronged the Tema Metropolitan Assembly forecourt to watch TV3 special live outside broadcasts of our favorite telenovela, Do Not Love Me So Much. Uh, the telenovela, which is one of TV3's many entertainment pieces, gives an insight on a couple who are struggling to hold their marriage together. Do Not Love Me So Much is a story of a couple who are driven apart ironically because of the intense love they share. The story is entangled with a lot of secrets, uncertainties, betrayals, backstabbing and family quarrels. I know that you don't believe in veneration or fasting but, but you accepted it without, without giving a second thought. Thanks a lot for that. The maiden public viewing was greeted with massive patronage in Tama. Viewers were treated to music and fun activities with children, with a lot of giveaways from Carbell to the fans. TV3 and Carbell Initiative caught on so well. How could you do that? How can you be so mad at your own son? He's serving his sentence. The series has been airing on TV3 for the past three months and audience have been glued to the story as it unfolds. Well, I'm sure some other part of the country cannot wait for their turn to yes. for this outside <laughs> broadcast, so do not love me so much. My name is Issa Molly. Thanks for watching. And I am Portia Gabwa. Coming up is Music Music. Good night.